and Tourism Committee. I'm Councilwoman Tracy Park, chair of this committee. Uh, Mr. Clerk, Mr. Espinoza is with us today. Would you please call the roll? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Councilmember Park? Present. Councilmember McOsker? Councilmember Council McOsker is currently absent, and Councilmember um, Soto Martinez? Here. Okay, two members and a quorum. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. So that will bring us to public comment. Members wishing to give public comment can sign up at the kiosk in the back of the room. You'll be given one minute for general public comment and up to two minutes for multiple items. So if we could, looks like we have two folks signed up. We will go ahead and take our first commenter with the initials GND. If your initials are GND. That's right. Uh, yes, we'll, we'll speak on all of the items in general comment. Okay, you have uh, three minutes. Go ahead. And for the record, we came here to trash Pat McOsker, but since he's not here, We'll trash you later. <laughs> well said. <laughs> now, oh, look at number one. Former Congresswoman Lucille Roy Ball Allard. <laughs> yes, she's had a distinguished career. Her father is named after the Public Works Building. And on this day, we could have been holding this meeting downstairs in the Roy Ball Public Works Building. Wouldn't that have been fitting, everybody? <laughs> but why are we here on the fourth floor? Yes, it's because Pat McOsker decided to go downstairs and huddle down on his budget and his corruption downstairs and deny Lucille the chance to be ingratiated in her father's honor downstairs. <laughs> so we should definitely redo this meeting down there, yes. Okay, which item are you on? Well, uh, ma'am, I mean... Isn't Lucille Roy Ball Allard on the agenda? <laughs> yeah, number one. That's right, number one, yes. <laughs> and she's going to serve on the board of the Harbor Commissioners. <laughs> yes, they're having a little strike down there. Um, see if you can get those people paid. <laughs> so we will support this. Yes, how come you're being so nice to her? <laughs> because she never treated me like an asshole before. <laughs> see, when you treat me right, I treat you right. When you treat me wrong, I treat you right. <laughs> All right, let's stick to the agenda. Now we get to number two, Vanessa Aramayo on the corrupt board of airport corrupt commissioners. <laughs> the best thing to do is retain a business card from the Covington Law Firm. The Covington Law Firm, the largest white collar criminal firm in the United States. Eh, you know, in the case you need it later. <laughs> number three, John Vane. <laughs> yes, to the city tourism commissioners. We don't even know that that exists. Then we get Recondo and Associates for this little tiny weeny little contract of a mere $25 million. Tracy, you can't buy anything at the airport for a measly $25 million. Go puppet moves to increase this to $50 million. <laughs> I suck it. And Hugo seconds it too. <laughs> now we have Lulu's place, a number five. Lulu's place, yes. We go there and eat. Nom 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 nom. Yes, all the other places down there, a bunch of junk food overpriced, but not Lulu's place, no. So we want to continue with it. And then the people mover. This is the reason why Tracy Park came to the council on number six to get that $43 million to move people from the airport parking lot to the goddamn... All right. Thanks, Goat Puppet. Yeah, All right. Our next speaker is A. Grebner. Can you confirm that you've signed up to speak on item number six? Uh, it was um, three, I think. And general comment. All right, you'll have two minutes. Go ahead. Okay, so three is the um, is the reappointment of the of of John Vane to the 
City Tourism Commission. I oppose this reappointment because he's also on the board of directors for the LA Police Foundation. Um, and we shouldn't have any, and that's really, you know, goes to show what the city's strategy is on tourism, that all you want to do is just, you know, have people, I mean, this is the police foundation that recently, the city just approved donating a robot dog to the LAPD. Um, so, you know, it seems like maybe, um, not having someone from a, you know, way the way the LAPD gets these backdoor donations without, you know, like, you know, we're not even, they're not even going to, they already get like, you know, so much of the budget every year and now they're getting these backdoor donations and now the mayor wants to reappoint someone from that board to the city tourism, you know, commission or whatever, you know, it's, it's just the same thing. The same strategy the city's always doing. It's just one little, you know, circle. Um, so, especially Ugo, please vote this down. If you voted against the robot dog, you should also be... You voted against the robot dog, which, thank you for that. And now, please vote against this, you know, appointment. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Grubner. Next up, we have Mr. Denny Schneider. And uh, Mr. Schneider, I have you signed up to speak I'm, on item six. I meant five. Five? Okay, so you have one minute for the item. That's all I need. Okay, I'm, go. I'm here just to speak positively about, I like the idea of Lulu's Place. The big concern we have, of course, is that uh, we don't know exactly what it is, and it's not promised for any length of time and it's not controlled except for by the executive director in the future uh, because it the the lease says that you can't bring it back through everything the executive director will be able to make changes in the future I trust the current administration but over the course of 50 years I have no idea what's coming and hope to see this in the neighborhood council soon too thank you mr. Schneider Okay, it uh, looks like that was everyone who signed up for public comment, so that will conclude public comment. Uh, unless there is any objection from my colleague, Council Member Soto Martinez, I would like to move items one, two, and three on consent. Any objections? No. Okay, if you would, Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Thank you, Council Member Park? Yes. Council Member McCosker is absent, and Council Member Soto Martinez? Yes. So two yeses, and these two are approved on consent. Thank you very much. We will go ahead and move on to item number four. Mr. Clerk, if you could please read the item. Thank you. Item number four is a report from the Board of Airport Commissioners relative to approving um, the contract with Recondo and Associates covering professional consultational services to provide environmental, technical, and expert consulting services for the modernization of the cargo facilities at the Los Angeles International Airport. Okay, thank you so much. It looks like we have Mr. Urbachi and Ms. Mestis here to present on this item. We're looking forward to hearing from you. The floor is yours. Thank you, council members. Um, I apologize for the glasses. I have some eye problems, so I'm not, not trying to give the Hollywood look here today. Looks good so, on you. So, thank, thanks. Um, we're gonna have, uh, I'm gonna, there's, we have four items, so I'm just gonna be here and support our team, but um, I'll let Terry take over. Great, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I have some slides that we prepared just to walk you through the effort. So if I could point you to uh, the slide after the cover slide there. So a little background on our cargo facilities um, and the success that we've had with cargo. So currently we're ranked fifth um, in the U.S. for cargo tonnage. Um, this has been certainly um, an area of, uh, of revenue and opportunity for us during COVID. And so as a result of that, and also as a, as a result of the condition of our existing facilities, so we have about 27 buildings today, all are at end of life, or um, some of these facilities were never intended to be for cargo. So we have a great opportunity here to create some, um, some uh, facilities that are intended for cargo use and to uh, incorporate some innovations that will make these really um, state of the art and, um, and great facilities. Um, and so the modernization goals um, are also to uh, consolidate the land use. Right now these buildings are spread over a large part of our campus. 
Um, there's an opportunity to consolidate that. Um, and also to improve our truck staging. So uh, trucks, uh, we have a lot of truck traffic that comes to uh, pick up the cargo. Um, with some uh, truck staging areas, we could uh, really um, consolidate the queuing and, uh, and have those pickups occur in a much uh, more efficient and faster fashion. So if I take you to the next slide here, it gives you a site plan of where the existing cargo facilities are located today. Um, there are three areas identified on that site plan. There's Century Cargo East, uh, which we're calling Phase 1. Um, Imperial Cargo East um, is uh, Phase 2. And then Imperial West is an area that we're not going to be addressing um, in this effort. We're just going to be addressing the uh, Century East and Imperial East. If you look at the, uh, the next slide here, um, that's going to give you um, an idea of uh, what phases one and two uh, look like. So uh, phase one in that upper portion of the exhibit um, is where the, uh, the cargo facility would be located. Um, the, the concept that was provided by the developer who is, um, the, was the highest scoring proposer in this effort um, identified a facility that's about 1.6 million square feet uh, with uh, two stories. It would have a lot of innovation as far as um, automated systems that would help move the cargo around, and it would also be a very flexible facility that would be able to address different types of cargo. Um, the phase two is shown in green at the bottom of that exhibit. Um, that would be a future phase. So as part of this effort, um, it would be supporting the environmental process for the entire concept, phase one and phase two. Um, and, uh, and then after this, we would go forward and develop that phase one piece, that area in blue at the top of the slide. If you look to the far right of the, uh, the site plan, that is where we are proposing some truck staging. There would be a truck staging lot. Um, plus some potential amenities for truck drivers. Again, all of this would be looked at as part of the environmental process and looking at the impacts in the surrounding and in the, within the community. If you go to the next slide, that'll give you an idea of all the different steps uh, that we need to take going through the environmental process. So this is CEQA and NEPA. We're anticipating that the process will take uh, approximately two to three years to go through this process. Uh, I know that might seem um, like a lengthy amount of time, but there are a lot of steps. So if you look at the right-hand side of the slide there, you can see all the different items. Um, and as we go through the steps, there might be areas that we need to pay additional focus to that might take longer than anticipated. And then if you go to the last slide, and in all of our procurements, uh, there is a big emphasis on inclusivity. And certainly that was um, part of this process as well. You can see there what the uh, winning proposer, uh, what they committed to as far as inclusivity, is, um, uh, and they're meeting um, all of the goals that we set out in the procurement. Uh, in addition to that, um, you can see that the uh, team structure um, 85% of their team structure falls into the SBE, DVBE, and LSBE, um, LBE categories, which we thought was really positive. They've committed to a, a college internship program, which is a well above and beyond the goals that we set forth in the procurement, as well as STEM engagement and a commitment to collaborate with some of our local um, educational uh, partners, such as the LACCD, the local community college district. And with that, that's the end of my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, you know, one of the things that the report mentioned is that the current facility is not being compatible with current operating standards. Can you talk to us a little bit more about why they're not compatible, what some of the issues are? Sure. Um, a lot of the buildings were built not to be cargo facilities, and, and they've been turned into that um, and trying to take advantage of the fact that they were there. So um, just as far as uh, building size, um, the capacity of the buildings to hold the cargo, um, the way that the cargo moves around the building um, is just uh, not as efficient as, as current day and current practices are. Can you uh, talk to us a little bit more about the scope of community outreach that has occurred on this? Uh, right now, there hasn't been a lot of community outreach. Um, hopefully, with this effort, should it be approved, we would go out, and, and that would be part of this entire process, engaging community to make sure that um, we have the community's needs as part of this process, and that could be incorporated into the CEQA and NEPA. Okay. 
Okay, and, and I just I think I've said this before and I think you guys know where I land on community engagement, but that's something that continues to be really important to me as well as our surrounding communities that are, are impacted by a lot of this. So I would um, really like to see ongoing engagement with our neighborhood councils and organizations like RSAC and labor to the extent that they can be impacted by this as well. Absolutely. Um, I think that some of these um, small business enterprise goals are excellent. I always love it when a contractor is exceeding some of the expectations that we have um, established for them. I, I know they've worked with LAWA and at LAX before. What has their, their history been on this? Sure. Well, the contractor that's part of this team is uh, Hensel Phelps. Um, they have done a sub Oh, Ricondo, I'm so sorry. Uh, I'm mixing up my cargo procurements, um, is Ricondo. And Ricondo actually has done a significant amount of work for us. So we have a current environmental bench, which Ricondo is on, uh, in which they help us on a multitude of different things. Um, they've also supported, um, I believe, our ATMP um, environmental process, which is for um, C0T9, uh, the roadways, and some of our airfield work. So they are very, very familiar with the work that's happening at LAWA and with the community. Great. Good. Um, so one of the things that you mentioned as well is some level of automation that is going to go into the system. Is that going to have an impact on workers or labor? Uh, I don't believe so. I, I think it'll be a very positive impact as far as helping the cargo be able to be facilitated around the, the new structure, the new building. So I, I think it'll be a positive um, impact for labor. Okay, so we're not looking at potential lo job loss because of automation. I don't believe so. Okay, good to know. All right, I don't have any other questions. Do you have any? No, nope, no questions from my colleague. Um, great. So with that, then I will move that we approve item number four. Mr. Clerk, if you would please call the roll. Thank you, Councilmember Park. Yes. Councilmember McCosker is absent. Councilmember Soto Martinez. Yes. Two ayes, and this item is approved. Thank you. Let's move on to item number five. Mr. Clerk, if you would please read that item for us. Thank you. Item number five is a report from the Los Angeles World Airports relative to community outreach plan and the feasibility of creating a Lulu's Place Advisory S a Committee. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Bricker, for joining us as well. Um, I am going to turn the floor over to you to give us an update in your presentation. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, thank you for having me. Um, it's good to be here. Uh, we were here a few months ago to talk about Lulu's Place, and so we're here to give an update. Uh, we um, sent a letter on May 17th, which get, gave an overview of some of the activities that have taken place over the last few months. So. Uh, just to bring everyone up to speed, um, we have been working very closely with uh, the Lulu's Place representatives who have submitted information regarding um, the environmental uh, compliance uh, review process as well as the specific plan and the Northside design guidelines. That's very important to make sure that they, um, whatever they're proposing is consistent with the EIR that's already been approved and consistent with the specific plan and the design guidelines. So they submitted a pretty hefty package to us um, at, uh, in April and uh, we've been um, working with our consultants and our attorneys um, to go through um, all of that information and make sure it's consistent. And the reason why that's important is because that addresses a lot of the issues that have been raised by the community. So things like transportation and traffic, um, things like noise, uh, things like lighting, um, those are all things that they need to prove um, are consistent with the environmental report as well as consistent with the design guidelines. So that information has been submitted to us. Um, we have hired an outside consultant, AECOM, who actually did the original EIR uh, to um, assess what they've presented um, and give us um, information on whether or not it's in compliance, what additional analysis may need to be done, um, how it's in compliance with the design guidelines. So we're in that process right now, um, and it's a very uh, thorough process. Um, once we get through with that, it will also go to the Department of Planning and we will work with them to ensure that the executive director for planning um, agrees that they would be in compliance. So that's something that we felt was very important to do before we go back out to the community and present more information um, on the project because we want to make sure that what's being presented to the community is consistent with the EIR and is consistent um, with the design guidelines and that we can answer questions on things like the noise and the traffic and the lighting and that will be part of the presentation that goes to the community. So this is a very important 
important step. Um, it's, it's not visible to the community. They haven't seen this information yet, but it's something that we are doing. Um, we also, and I know it was very important that we reach out to the Manitoba Apartments um, that um, we have been trying to do for the last several weeks, um, and I'm happy to say that there will be a, a meeting with them on um, Thursday. So we do have a meeting with um, that group, and uh, we will have members from the team as well as the design team there who will be presenting information to the community, answering their questions. Um, we flyered the entire uh, complex um, and worked uh, with management to set that up. So we're happy that that's taking place. Um, a little overdue, but we've been working uh, diligently to try to get that um, accomplished. And then I believe uh, the representatives are also talking to uh, the Neighborhood Council tonight and giving them just a brief update as to where things are, um, just to keep them in the loop of what's happening. Um, assuming the environmental compliance review goes um, forward uh, in an expeditious manner, uh, they would like to go out and have an open house uh, with the community um, in July. And, uh, you know, again, the idea would be that we would have um, designs, we would have a detailed project description, uh, we would have information on things like trip counts and traffic, uh, we would be able to talk about um, operating hours um, and answer a lot of the concerns that have been raised by the community. Um, we would have members of the team there, we would have the design team there, and we really would have stations. So if someone's interested in landscaping, if they're interested in programmatic activities, all of that uh, would be available to the community. So right now we're targeting July, but again, it will depend on this um, compliance review. And I know the other thing that was very important to this group was an advisory committee. And so uh, we have worked um, very closely uh, with uh, the representatives for Lulu's Place. They are in the process of forming an advisory committee. They've agreed to do that. Um, I've told them that it's very important that we have um, members from the community there, as well as members who um, will be interested in their programmatic activities. So um, we are waiting for the final disposition of that committee, um, which I believe they're trying to form this summer. Um, and so that is in the works as well, and they have committed to do that. Um, once the open house takes place, um, we will go back out to all of the community groups that we briefed um, beforehand um, and give individual briefings and uh, answer any questions that they have. Again, um, waiting on this first step of compliance review in order to pull the trigger on those next steps. So that's where we are. Um, we've been doing a lot of work behind the scenes. Um, we've been working uh, with city departments, getting questions answered on um, you know, utilities and sanitation and the Argo uh, complex, which is right next to it. Um, they've been working on their design, um, incorporating many of the um, comments that we received from the community. Um, and they've also been reaching out programmatically to start looking at their operating agreement, who will actually be operating on that site. So those are things that are, again, happening behind the scenes, but we're hoping to target July uh, to go back out to the community with information. And happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Bricker. So it sounds, I just want to make sure I heard you right. So what you have back are, is documentation demonstrating compliance with the EIR, the Northside Specific Plan, and the design guidelines. You have that back yet, but you're still in your review process working with your outside consultants. So um, when you go to Neighborhood Council this evening or to the Manitoba neighbors later this week, what exactly are you going to be presenting them? Doesn't sound like you're quite there yet. So I think um, for tonight, I think it'll be to lay out a lot of what we um, laid out to you in the letter. So what our projected next steps might be, where we are in the process, um, what we're hoping to do, just really um, kind of a quick update to the Neighborhood Council on where things stand. In terms of Manitoba, you know, we hadn't briefed them um, before uh, the process started. And so I think it's one, introducing them to what the project is. Um, what some of the background of the project is, um, understanding where we are in the design process now. So we do know um, some elements of design which have been um, presented in previous meetings. So um, presenting that information to that community. And then really, I think, taking stock of what their concerns are. We know that they've mentioned issues spill over from light. So the designers will be there to talk about how they're handling that. That's something that they were well aware of. They worked on the North Side Design Guidelines. So I think they want to address those type of issues, things about traffic um, 
and transportation, um, as well as things about noise, which has come up from those communities. So I think they want to listen specifically to the concerns, present what they have now, um, with the idea that when we go back to the community, hopefully we'll have been able to stamp that it's in compliance, that what they're proposing uh, fits within that umbrella, um, and they can give more information at that time. Great, and I really appreciate the outreach that you've done to that particular community, and there may be other residents and, and folks there that need to be engaged as well, and it sounds like this is gonna need to be a process that continues over time as the picture comes together and additional information is acquired and mitigating measures to address some of the current concerns that we anticipate may come up um, are, are rolled out. So I wanna thank you for what you've done so far. Uh, we're making progress, but it looks like we still have uh, a little bit of a ways to go on that. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I, I might also just ask of you that as you are planning your community meetings, if you would let my staff know when those are, we would like to help you publicize them and make sure that we're getting this as deeply saturated into the community as we can for the most robust engagement as possible. Right, we would welcome that. All right, fantastic. Um, I don't have any other questions at this time, do you? Just a comment. Yeah. Yeah, so want thank you so much for coming here and presenting. Sounds like y'all are doing a lot of outreach and engaging folks. Council member, I'm sure, would be very helpful in, in, in making that even more robust, so just wanna say thank you for that. And as chair of the committee, that is something that I think I speak for all of us when we say that this is is really important, that these are communities that need to have a voice and their um, in, input needs to be received and incorporated to the extent that it can be. So I, I commend you for your efforts on that. Um, okay, so with that, um, I will move that we note and file this report. Uh, Mr. Clerk, if you would, please call the roll. Thank you, Council Member Park. Yes. Council Member McCusker is absent. Council Member Soto Martinez. Yes. So two yeses, and this item is noted and filed. Great, thank you, Mr. Clerk. That brings us to item number six. Item number six is a report from the Board of Airport Commissioners relative to approving the Third Amendment to a contract with Austin Commercial for a contract uh, covering the, the terminal cores and automatic people mover interface project at the Los Angeles International Airport and related matters. Okay, well, thank you for, for being here. Can you tell us your name? Sure, yeah, thank you for having uh, us. Uh, my name is Hans Telenius. I'm a deputy executive um, over the terminal development program uh, at LAX. All right, Mr. Telenius, I yes, hope I pronounced correct. that correctly. Correct, Telenius, yes. Thank you for being here. Uh, the floor is yours. We're looking okay. forward to the update. Okay, wonderful. So um, I wanted to bring before you a report on this Third Amendment which is really to resolve uh, open change requests and a, and a schedule extension really because of these open change requests. So on the second page, this is a little bit of a map of, of LAX to kind of orient you on what this project or contract really is. There are three main areas um, going from left to right. Um, there was a small core and a core is the term we use where the people mover bridges uh, come into the terminal. So the importance of this project is as the train was getting built and the bridges were installed, they had to go somewhere. And you needed to create a building where these bridges can land and then from there you can distribute the, the passengers around. So that's what made this you know, a, a key part of the infrastructure. Uh, so there was one at Terminal 7 on the left and then in the middle in the yellow is one at 5.5, uh, so that's between five and six. Uh, that's been completed. And then over at Tibet, which is really the heavy lift and, and the most complicated building to build, was done in, in three steps. So it's the green and the blue, which is complete, and then the uh, orange, and all this is to be done at the end of this year. And what you'll see on the next slide, the, the problem with that building is the only way to get to it to build it, whether it's lumber or people or equipment, is literally through the front door. It's like renovating your kitchen and the only way in is through the front door. And there's other things that go in the front door besides you know, the appliances to the kitchen. You know, your life has to continue. Um, so the next page is just a couple of pictures of where we are. Um, in the left is the completed uh, part of Tibet. Upper right is the 5.5, and then in the lower right is what's still under construction. So um, the next few pages is really what the issue is. There's these site and operational issues. And like I'd mentioned earlier, the only way to get to this site is through the front door. And because there's so much volume with the international traffic, most of the work is done at night, 
the hours tend to be more like 11 p.m. to 5 or 6 p.m. And every time there is a flight delay because passengers are coming in or the, or the plane's leaving, we cannot start work. Um, it, it's, I mean, it, it, like I said, there's only one way to get to this place and the passengers take preference. And so decisions had to be made over a two year period, you know, what comes first and the passengers, you know, do tend to come first. Um, there's also the vehicle traffic that keeps changing because of other utility things we do in the road. So it's a constant moving target and it's really hard to get to the job site. So there's an impact for this and that impact does cost money. Um, the next is more scope issues that, that we, so we bought the job at 60% and of course we go to 100. And the two main things is that the outside facade needed to be more of a crown jewel this is the, you know, this is the international terminal. This is the end station. Uh, we wanted better glass. It, it was better energy savings, uh, more uh, natural light, and things of that nature. And then the um, other page of the floor plan, we actually added a fifth floor to the project because we found that real estate is in such high demand to rent it. Now's the time to add a fifth floor, not after the building's finished. So that's the main thing besides rearranging uh, bathrooms and elevators, so the floor is a much more rentable space instead of cut up. And then just to provide an update on the inclusivity on how Austin Commercial is doing, they are doing quite, quite well. Um, the second last page has the requirements. For example, local business requirement is seven and they're doing 39 percent. So there's, there's a lot of emphasis from our organization to the contractors about how important you know the local and the community is which has been a common theme that you know we all we all embrace um 29 percent of the workforce has been local and seven of those people have come out of the higher lax program which is a really good program uh and with that i welcome any questions all right well thank you for that and you know i just I, you know i love our higher lax program i think that that is just a fantastic opportunity for workforce development it makes me really glad to see that that program is being utilized yeah and that, yeah um, it's it's good for both sides yeah our, our contractors are really leaning into that thank yep. you um so can you kind of just give us a quick ballpark picture of what kind of work is remaining and are we confident that this 12 million dollar contingency is enough Yes, so um, the way we looked at the remaining contingency is really about the amount of work we still had to spend. Um, you know, originally the contract was 300 plus million, so 12 million would be relatively small. Most of that work's in place. We have about $75 million worth of work left. So 12 million is, you know, is a good, you know, it's, it's more than 10% of that number of left to do. The other big thing is we are out of the ground so a lot of the risk happens when you're in the ground. We did find a few things that we didn't know about. Um, elevator pits to be one of them, but we're past that. So, um, and we do on a monthly basis, I get with the team, we review the cost reports, we review our risk registers to see where we are. So at the moment, I feel very comfortable with it. Okay. Um, another question for you, different subject, but how often does project scope change after 60% design. Is this normal? So, <laughs> no. Okay. Not anymore. Glad it wasn't just me. <laughs> so, so this is, this was a while ago that this was, this was done. Um, we've implemented a lot more policies and, and controls. So we, we want to make sure that we're adhering as much as possible. Now there is, there, there are things that happen that you come across a particular situation and you realize that if you spend a little bit more money right now, you actually gain greater benefits. Um, but that's a cost benefit analysis. We have to make sure that there's a cost value justification from that. Um, but the, the idea is, is that we, are, uh, we have to be very strict with our capital spend right now because we're spending so much and we're pushing, you know, pretty high from our, our ability to leverage. And so we have to make sure that all of our jobs come in uh, based upon uh, you know, what, what we expect them to. So these, these types of changes uh, are not something that we take lightly or um, and they have to go through a rigorous process with our entire organization, our executive team now. 
And I understand you have very, very challenging site conditions, uh, a lot of unknowns as a project of this size and scale uh, unfolds yeah. over time. So I, I do understand that. Um, are there steps that LAWA can take to ensure that changes are covered by existing contingencies moving forward? So as as we build a project, and you know, and through its project life cycle, we take a bit of time to really review and create a risk register. We it, it's not just a formula; it should be 10% because it feels like 10%. We will go through the step because some projects just are riskier than others. Uh, you take a, a greenfield or a brownfield site, your probability of running into Problems, you know, when you go vertical are very small, but when you do a renovation inside a building, you don't know what you're going to uncover. So depending on the project type, um, will determine really how much contingency you need to make sure you have the right amount. And so you plan up front. Gotcha. Okay. All right. Well, I love the I love the glass. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just FYI, I love yeah, it. we're all looking forward to when it's really done. It's, it's really going to um, be beautiful. It it'd be a lot better than looking at barricades. So. Indeed. <laughs> uh, I don't have any other questions, Council Member Soto Martinez. Uh, I'll just make a comment that, you know, I, I used to work at the airport as a union organizer and I, I went there a few months ago. I could not recognize it. Yeah, I was just like, oh my God. Like, yeah. even the parking lots and where the people move is going. And it's, I, I'm looking forward to its completion, or maybe it'll never be complete, but uh, <laughs> at, least, at least this, uh, the, the, two, the two bonds that, we, that we've put out. Yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah, thank you. Likewise. All right. Um, well, I would move that we prove, approve item number six. And if you would, Mr. Clerk, please call the roll. Thank you. Council Member Park? Yes. Council Member McOsker is absent. Council Member Soto Martinez? Yes. Two yeses, and this item is approved. Thank you so much. And I believe this brings us to our final item, number seven. If you would, Mr. Clerk, please read that item for us. You add number seven is a report from the Board of Airport Commissioners relative to approving a five-year progressive design-build contract with Hensel Phelps Construction Company covering phase one of the landscaping improvement project uh, program at Los Angeles International Airport. Okay, well, thank you for that, and I will turn it back over to you for our final presentation. Thank you, Council Members. Um, the, this last item is, is a very important item for us. Um, you know, we're doing all this construction and it's beautiful and we're building state-of-the-art facilities and we'll be providing a phenomenal customer experience as a result. Um, but this, this initiative is a little bit different in the sense that um, we're, build we're building a house, but we have to build the front lawn in the backyard and the landscaping around the house as well. And that's what this project is. Um, you see many of the areas right now that are being used for construction lay down, and for um, you know other materials and whatnot, and when when we're finished with this next phase, um, which uh, most of it should be done by the end of next year, uh, we're going to have these areas now that are going to be uh, empty spaces, and so we wanted to take a little different approach rather than just put concrete and co and more parking down there. We wanted to create uh, more green space for the for the airport. And we think that this green space is important for many reasons, not just um, the, the, um, uh, the, the beautification of the, of the area to, to make it seem like it's not just a concrete jungle, but also to provide a space for passengers um, when they have time in between their flights, somewhere to go and enjoy the beautiful Los Angeles weather. And for our employees, our employees need to have a place to go. They will not have really a place where they can go uh, in between the lunchtime and between their shifts or whatever and just relax and have lunch or, or sit outside and meditate or whatever they want to do. And so these areas that we're planning to build here uh, are going to provide those open space and those green space. We're also going to be able to use it for some concessions. So we have some, some concessions out there where we can offer food and drink and things for, for the people who want to, to hang out there and it'll help us from a revenue perspective. Uh, and we're also taking the, the ability for this to, to do some nice things to the parking lots in order to m make it so that there's some green and some um, nice things to look at instead of just the concrete that's there today. And we'll also be imp imp um, implementing some digital, um, some huge digital signage where we can put art um, and other types of 
uh, digital displays uh, on, on there for people to see as they go around the central terminal area. So I, I probably stole most of Terry's no, thunder, but this is, a, this <laughs> is one that's important to me. And <laughs> uh, I also want to give Commissioner Shagan, who's re since retired from the board, resigned from the board, um, but he was instrumental in, in working with us to get, to get this. Right, thank you for that lead in. Um, so this is phase one of a design build. So this would be for design services for this project. If you look at the um, second slide there in the deck, um, that gives you a, a good um, site plan of the potential different areas that um, could be used for this plaza space. Um, it's, and you see it on there, these green areas, West Plaza, the Theme Plaza, and the East Plaza. Um, and there's some great pictures on the next slide, but the theme plaza would be an area that uh, could potentially really build up a, a great experience uh, where you could get to the theme building and really enjoy that space. Um, so all in all, um, there's about 13 potential um, acres of, of area that we could use for this project. Um, and then there's also a little over 100,000 square feet of facade area of the parking garages that we would look to beautify. And this would be enjoyed not only for the pedestrian, but also for vehicular traffic and those arriving on the automated people mover could look down and really see these, these beautiful spaces. So if you go to the next slide, that gives you some of the images that were submitted uh, with the winning proposer's um, proposal. And, um, and you can see there in the first image on the upper left, um, there's a view of a, of a coffee concession spot. Um, that again, these are just conceptual ideas at this point, um, but there could be concessions, there would be signage that would take um, pedestrians around the area to enjoy. Um, if you look over on the right, you see an image of what that potential um, theme building area could look like. Um, and then on the lower left, it shows you an image of what the parking facades, um, parking garage facades could look like. There's some screening material on there as well as some digital screens that um, promote uh, maybe events, but also provide direction and give other information to visitors, as well as some green space. And then the image on the lower bottom is just a plan view of the theme building. So there would be some green space, it would be plaza space to, to walk around, areas to sit, there would be an opportunity to have art in this area too, um, and some um, potentially some big pieces that could be viewed as you're going along the people mover, and um, and then potentially some new uh, lane areas for drop off and pickup of passengers. If you go to the next slide, um, this slide just gives you a quick um, summary of um, the approach to inclusivity from this team. Um, they have agreed to meet all of our goals. Our goals are listed on the far left. Um, and they've also um, committed, of course, to our 30% uh, local worker hire, um, our local worker participation, which is um, dictated by our PLA. Um, this particular team, they have done a great job in the past of hiring our LAX graduates and have made a commitment to do so on this project. Um, also a commitment to hire 27 local workers per month and uh, nine local apprentices per month during the course of this project, which is really exciting. And then lastly, um, that chart there that you see on the upper right um, shows you some of the team members which make up that um, inclusivity participation. And I just wanted to note that um, some of those are women-owned, small minority women-owned businesses as well. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Uh Love it, uh, especially the women and minority owned businesses and continuing to see LAWA contracting with businesses that are committed to this is I think, I speak for all of us on this committee, something that is critically important. So this is great, great to see. Um, and I just wanted to comment generally that this open space finishing flare <laughs> to this massive capital improvement project that has been ongoing for years now is really just the cherry on top of, of, of the, the cake here. Um, I think that the concept is really, it's visionary, it's beautiful, it is absolutely going to change and finish the passenger experience coming through LAX. Um, I love what you're doing with the theme plaza and making that space accessible. We see it all the time as Agilinos, it's iconic to travelers, and yet it's something that's always barricaded and nobody ever knows how to get to it. It hasn't had programming and so on. And so I'm so thrilled that you are incorporating that. And just generally the focus on sustainability and green space. I think this is a great finish. And so I just want to commend you for it. Um, I did have a question. Uh, the report talks a little bit about target value design. I don't, I don't know a lot about it, what that is. Can you 
just educate me a little bit? Sure. Well, all of our projects do have a, a, a budget. And so when we set off and embark on with these teams, especially on the design build side, we do give them a value that they are supposed to design to and that we monitor along the way that will help uh, maybe mitigate some from the previous uh, report, mitigate those situations from happen happening. So that's a target value. We provide them with a the number, we monitor it, uh, we make sure that the scope um, that, we, uh, that we delineate that's required is all gonna fit into that. And so that's really what, that's, what that it's intended to be. Good to know. Um, I know in the past we have talked about some challenges that we have had uh, with interagency things that have happened like on the ATM, ATMP and on, Con, on CONRAC. Um, are, is there anything we're doing to prevent some of that from happening here? Is there ways that we can mitigate against that? Yes, we have been working hard on that. Uh, we're actually meeting with all of our third party partners to, um, to revisit our MOU. Um, and, uh, and actually we're crafting an amendment right now of our MOU that will um, support these projects and, um, and really support us working better together. Uh, we also have formal partnering with a lot of these agencies. We also provide them with uh, physical office um, um, provisions, spots, cubes for them to come and sit and actually work with us. So there's a, a lot going on to uh, strengthen that for all of these new projects. Good, incorporating lessons learned. Absolutely. <laughs> I like to yes. see that. Yes. All right, thank you. I don't have any other questions. Councilmember Soto Martinez. Thank you so much, uh, Chair. Uh, yeah, I was like, uh, as soon as I saw the rendering, I was like, oh my God, this is beautiful. Uh, and I feel <laughs> it like makes a, such a big a difference. Because it's very, very different. Um, I do have one question. I, I noticed that there, I didn't know this, but last time I traveled to LAX, there's like a little dog park by Terminal 8. Like, uh, I don't know if that's used for the passengers or just for the LAPD, but. I was like, is there a demand for that? Maybe incorporating some of that into here? There's a huge demand, Ed. We have, we have uh, pet facilities in most of our terminals. So it's a little area where people who do travel with pets can bring them, uh, you know, for them to run around and other things. So yeah, so we, we incorporate, and we're, well, I think we're incorporating pet, uh, pet space in there, yeah. Yes, absolutely, that's part of the scope of work. We wanna be able to support pets as well as they come to LAX. Great. You know, pets are the new children, so we gotta <laughs> we gotta keep up with the demand, I guess. Thank They're you. Less expensive. That's, <laughs> that's true. They don't talk back. Happy Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, uh, really appreciate you being here, um, and I would move to approve item number seven, if you would, Mr. Clerk. Please call the roll. Thank you, Councilmember Park. Yes. Councilman McOsker is absent. Councilmember Soto Martinez. Yes. And this item is approved. All right, Mr. Clerk, do we have anything else in front of the committee? No, the desk is clear. All right, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thanks so much.